Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this little guy right here. This is the California Custom Knife Show um, for the 2018. So I uh, I went on ahead, and I first off, I want to thank the, the, the LA for bringing this along. <laughs> I live down in San Diego now, and so driving up to LA is like uh, about two hours or so. Um, and th this show happened to be in Anaheim, and so you know what, I figured, why not? Let's go ahead and check it out. And so I figured I'd throw up a video, talk to people about who all is uh, who all's doing that. So um, anyways, let's go ahead and jump into it. Oh, first off. I'm sorry, size comparison, Spydeco Delica. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I just kind of want to talk about, as usual, the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly of the California Custom Knife Show. So on the good side, you know, honestly, the venue was great. It was just an embassy suites, you know, ballroom or something like that, but it was laid out well. You can see here they had tables. Tables were all numbered by row, which is great. Um, and it was just, it was pretty intuitive. It was a nice room. It was big enough that it didn't feel like, oh my God, we're running over each other. Um, but it was also... Um, you know, it wasn't like crazy expansive. It wasn't too loud. I mean, honestly, I get no complaints about the venue. I'd be happy to see it there again. Parking was a bit of an issue, but hey, whatever, not a big deal. And organization-wise, this was beautifully organized. Um, This was Recon One. They were a major Shiro dealer, and they do some other knife selling as well. But they're, they're, um, they're, this was the first time that they were running it. And honestly, I, I didn't go to it before, but this was really well done. Like, I couldn't, I honestly wouldn't have thought that this was their first time doing it. They they were on freaking point for this. I mean, you could tell that by, you know, the fact that there were no snafus at any point here. I mean, I walk up, I pay cash, I get my bracelet, I get in the line, I wait in the line, I get in. And just at no point was there any friction related to the running of the convention itself. Maybe behind the scenes it was a wreck. I don't know that. I, I have no, but from my perspective as an attendee, they really, hand, they were on point. They were actually on point in terms of communication, too. Like, their website made it easy to understand understand what was going on, with one exception that I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, everything was, you know, on point. They give you these little maps here, and the map shows you exactly where everybody is. It lists everybody alphabetically. Um, they just this was really well organized. And frankly, it came across as a little bit more well organized than Blade Show. And so I, I got to give them credit for that. This was really well done there. And so good job on that one, Recon 1. Next thing, um, one thing that I, I was very nice is actually they have a good selection of suppliers of knife-related materials here. So like Alpha Knife Supplies, one of the big providers of Timascus out there, American Metal Exchange, Cabo Quartz, Knife and Gun Finishing, Nichols Damascus, True Grit, it's an abrasives company, and then Vegas Forge. And the thing is, um, very often as you're making custom knife orders, it's it's difficult to figure out, okay, do I want Timascus if you've never seen Timascus? It's difficult to know, you know, hmm, okay, should I do Vegas Forge, Damascus, or Damasteel? Well, if you've never handled either, it's really tough to say. And so going to a show like this and being able to spend some time at the Vegas Forge booth and just be like, uh, yeah, actually, I really like this pattern, I really like this pattern, this pattern, not so much... That's great. Um, and it makes it really easy for an enthusiast down the road to figure things out. And especially with exotic materials, like this Cabo Quartz thing, is suddenly the new hotness. Those are the Emperor's newest clothes in the custom knife game. And I had never seen it. I'd seen pictures of it all around, and it didn't look that great to me in pictures. And so I figured, oh, it must be one of those materials where once you get in hand... Yeah, actually, I, it turns out I still don't get it. I, it looks like something you'd get as an upgrade to a kitchen countertop. I mean, whoever's marketing it deserves a raise, but uh, well, whatever. I mean, maybe you love it, but I, I I walked away from this knowing that, no, carbon quartz is not something I'm ever interested in. Like, can I pay you more not to get it? I, I, I But that's, again, that's purely my own aesthetic opinion. People who may love it, sure, have fun. But um, yeah, anyways. So, it, but it was nice to be able to see that, to be able to go someplace where there was, you know, knives with carbo quartz, where there were carbo quartz chunks on the table. You could see all the options and make those determinations as you're actually working with a custom maker down the road. So that's great. And then, of course, I, on the, 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 the wrap up, the good side, there were a lot of really nice knives there. Um, you know, and by a bunch of different makers. I mean, as you can see here, there were many, many different makers, and I went through every booth, and I just wanted to try everything. I was looking for, you know, hidden gems, trying to, and just see what all is out there. And so I'll, I'll highlight some of the makers that jumped out at me as resoundingly doing good work. Um, you know, Beg Knives, Todd, uh, uh, Todd Beg, and Mark Skaggs, his brother. Um, the, the Todd Beg designs were there, Mark and, um, Matthias were there as well, and gr great people, but had some incredible freaking pieces on the table there, um, which is great. Um, Chris Reeve Knives was there, although they're less of a custom knife, more of a production knife, but still, they had a great selection. Um, Les George was there, and Les George is somebody I've, I've reviewed the ZT, uh, the version of the Hoppy. And then uh, I actually have on my table this little guy, which is a Les George VCP. Not from the show, actually. Borrowed from my buddy Chris. Um, but I, it was really impressive to see some of his stuff, because the only other thing I'd seen coming out of his shop was that Wilson Combat Eagle thing mess. 
And it's really nice to see that some of his stuff is really high end. Um, and so I, I liked seeing that. Um, the Rick Hinderer was there and I actually got to handle a bunch of the new XM18s and all of them had the tents that were on point. So that's really reassuring. Um, Alama Cutlery was there and had some beautiful things as always. Um, Pena Knives is there and Pena is every time I handle his stuff. It's just like, yeah, you're a really good maker. Um, Protec was there and, you know, they, 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 they're not super custom, although they have the custom meeps kind of stuff, the really high end stuff like you saw in that, um, Blade HQ uh, Knife Panther video. Uh, oh, man, they've got some great stuff there. I'm talking with them about that. Um, Shira Gorov was there. And then, uh, you know, of course, there were some other makers. And I'm not talking about... I, like, didn't spend much time with the fixed blade makers because it's just not my scene. Um, and, of course, it's not a complete list. There may be other people who are great who I'm just forgetting to mention at the moment. But those, at least for me, were the highlights. Beg, Chris Reeve, Les George, Hindra, Lamek, Pena, uh, Protec, and Shiro. Um, those were the makers who were really impressing me. So, um, to me, that's what's good is that there were some great knives there. Got to see a bunch of different varieties of materials. There were good messaging and communication by the Recon 1 team. It was really resoundingly well organized with no real headaches there and the venue was great. Um, on the great side to me were the people. Honestly, um, I had great conversations with a bunch of different people. Um, folks like um, Mark Skaggs of uh, Bag Knives. Uh, really, really great guy. He's a hugger, be warned. But that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a. Uh, it was great to be able to talk with folks and kind of get a sense of what's going on in there, in their world, in their business. Had a great talk with the mass drop folks, the folks who were managing the uh, the uh, sort of production knife world, like the Ferrum Forge Falcon and so on, um, for mass drop. That, that was a great set of convo, uh, conversations. Elijah Isham, the designer, was there. He and I chatted for a little while. I'm definitely going to be checking out more of his stuff. Um, Tim Reeve and I had a nice talk. Olamic. Rick Hinder even. He and I sat there and talked for a little while. He's got a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. I you know, don't feel like I'm at liberty to share. Those are his things to announce. But um, yeah, it just reinforced that yeah, Hinder is doing some good stuff lately. Um, and, you know, honestly, I also met up with a couple of buddies. My buddy Chris was there. I mean, a bunch of freaking folks were there um, that I got to chat with. And so, to me, that was what was great about this show, is the people at the show. I mean, the knives were cool, but the people were really the highlight for me. So, that's great. On the bad side. Unfortunately, um, the, the, the price was a little high. It was 40 bucks to get in as a VIP. But the problem is, being a VIP just puts you in the line of people that wrapped around the building at, to get in at 11, rather than the much shorter line to get in at noon. And considering that it's not the case that there was a lot of first come, first serve. Well, actually, there was, but that, that all happened the night before. We'll talk about that later. But um, they, honestly, that, that that felt a little bit... Eh. And, you know, honestly, I kind of wish I'd just stuck around and paid the 30 instead, but eh, not a big deal. Um, Next thing, this was a pretty quick show to experience. I mean, you can see here, I mean, it looks pretty big, but at the same time, these are all individual tables. I mean, the, the entire room was not ginormous. And so as a result, um, I didn't really... I, I felt like if I hadn't spent a bunch of time talking to some good people, I could have been out of there in like an hour and a half or something like that. I could have gone to every table, looked at everything they had, and been like, okay, yeah, I'm good. And, and so it wasn't like, you know, Blade Show, where I really felt like I needed days to be able to fully take it all in. This one was a, a, a quickie. So, um, you know, that, that, it's fine, but it's just a thing to keep in mind. Next thing that bugged me a little bit is that they had a bunch of who I refer to as glass holes. People with these big glass and wood cases full of knives. These are not necessarily collectors, although some of them are, but they, they, these are purveyors. These are flippers. These are people who buy knives on the secondary market or on the primary market, even worse, and then turn around and sell them to people at higher prices. And you can tell them. They're always just sitting at the show and they, 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 they're like, they've got the closed case in front of them. They're sitting there with crossed arms. Like, I don't care for these folks. I mean, they, 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 the prices tend to be really silly. Um, and they, they, they had all kinds of other stuff. There was one guy with a huge collection of these in-demand Rolexes at these stupid prices. And honestly, I felt like these folks, a lot of the knife purveyors, were just taking up space and offering very little in return. I mean, maybe if you're not yet aware that the internet is a thing and that you can buy knives from somebody who's not really trying hard to screw you, um, then those are going to be a useful service for somebody. But I felt like a lot of the tables, I would have preferred to go to an actual knife maker rather than somebody who's just buying from knife makers and trying to make a buck on top of that. Um, that, that, that bugs me a lot. And it's something I really don't like seeing at shows. I mean, at some level, you get to handle some stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten to. But at the same time, hey, I, that, that, that whole industry, I got a whole knife gripe on knife resellers. Um, and so, you know, that's not something I'm in love with. I wish that they had done a lot more of the table space to 
knife makers rather than these knife dealers, who are adding very little value, at least from my perspective. Um, uh, next thing, unfortunately, there were no hidden gems. One of my joy, one of my hopes was to go there and find, you know, a custom maker who I'd never heard of before, but was doing work that was just over the moon incredible. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't find that. I mean, the people who I knew were going to be good, just from my time in the community, were good. And there were some people who it's like, okay, yeah, maybe in a few years, you're going to be right where you need to be. But unfortunately, that was not something I didn't find anybody who jumped out at me. I brought money, hoping desperately that I could find somebody and just be like, yep, you, you, you got it. But no, unfortunately not. Because unfortunately, the next ugly or uh, bad thing is that there were a lot of ugly mistakes. Um, there were so many damn knives where the blade could cut you when close. This isn't one of them, but very often you'll see knives where like the, the blade itself is sticking slightly out of the back or it's so close in there it seems like a lot of makers just won't even pay it atten attention to that. Like, I must have set 10 knives back down on the table for that alone, right? Like, run up to something like, wow, that looks great, and then I pick it up, and it's just like, oh, you, come on. And, you know, so that was really frustrating, seeing all of these nice designs that were shot down due to these silly issues. And I, I want to plug my great knife checklist thing, because, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the only person with a solution to making a great knife, but it lists a number of really common problems that are just, that, that, that will kill a good knife design dead. And a number of those makers, maybe had they taken a look at something like that, could have dodged some of those issues and come away seeming a whole lot nicer than they ended up doing. Um, it's nickshabazz.com slash checklist. I don't know. I mean, feel free to do whatever. You, follow your hearts there, makers, but that might be a useful resource as you're figuring out what a picky jackass might say about your knives. And so that was a little frustrating, is that there were a lot of ugly mistakes being made there, and not the ones that are hard. Not like, oh, well, the action's not perfectly smooth. No, no like perfectly smooth actions. They were getting the hard part right and then ah, falling down to the finish line so that was frustrating and then the the, 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 the ugliest thing is that the the, the sleesh buoy test was not kind to a lot of these knives i have always talked about the fact that one of my requirements for a custom knife is that it needs to feel as good if not a little bit better than a, a good production knife like the spyderco sleesh buoy or a zt or something like that if your high-end custom knife does not have the same fit and finishing does not have the same action does not have as as a decent production knife, as like a hundred fifty, two hundred dollar production knife, even you know three hundred, then honestly, I I struggle a lot. I mean, there were definitely people who don't have that opinion. This is my own estimate. This is my own personal feeling. But the problem is, I could count on one hand the number of custom makers there who exceeded production knife standards. Where I handled their stuff, and it was like, yeah, this is this is even as good as a Spyderco Sleesh Bowie, a Techno, or something like that. And that was kind of disappointing, honestly. There was a lot of, like, blade play. There was a lot of, like, roughness. There were a lot of people who used Damascus and then etched the detent ball path. There were a lot of little issues like that where it was just like, oh, that's not quite right. And then they're wanting, you know, 1500 bucks for it, and it's just like, I can't do it. But, and so I felt more than ever walking out of this show, like, unfortunately, custom knives are just not my seed. I mean, I've said this many times before, but, and maybe that's my reason for feeling this way. If I were positively over the moon in love with the idea of one jackass in his garage making a knife, and by the way, the, the jackasses in garages can make incredible pieces, I, maybe I'd feel differently about it, but oh man, I, I I didn't feel great about the custom knife world walking out of there. Um, and so that's that was a little bit frustrating to me, and that in turn is the bad is that the, the sleesh Bowie test was not kind to a lot of the stuff that was there. There were a lot of ugly mistakes on the table that turned what could have been really incredible designs into like, nope, you take that one, that's all yours, have fun. I wasn't looking at it, no, not me. Um, there there were no hidden gems, unfortunately. There were a lot of jackasses with glass cases full of overpriced knives that they were trying to resell to somebody. Um, it was a pretty quick show to experience with all that, not that much size. It was a little pricey at the VIP level. On the ugly side, unfortunately, the biggest issue that this guy had is that it was, it felt a little bit picked through, and there's exactly one reason for that. Um, the, 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 the organizers of this show had uh, the night before, I came on the Saturday and I was there first thing on the Saturday, but the night before, they had a separate event called a Friday Night Blade Affair. Oh, ho, ho, ho. But the thing is, this was a $150 a head event, so holy crap, that's expensive. That was the night before at which they brought all of the high-end makers in, all of the super high-end makers, although I would argue that some of the makers they had in the, the show could have belonged, uh, whatever. But they had a lot of high-end makers, folks like John Barker, Peter Carey, Tim Gallion, Tony Mafioni, uh, Jeremy Marsh, R.J. Martin, Walter Randolph, Michael Raymond, Todd Rexford, Shirogorov, Sinkovich, Dmitry Sinkovich, that is, Mick Strider, Bob Terzawala, 
uh, Lee Williams and David Santiago, all of those people appeared only at the Friday night thing, with the exception of Shiro, who was there the next day as well. But these were most of the makers that, looking at the list of, you know, uh, of makers, I, those were the ones I was very often most excited to see. There were some other exciting makers in here. I don't want to demean them, for, but those were the ones who was like, whoa, the, 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 the top of the bill, so to speak. And unfortunately, those people w were not there. I had assumed when I when I was thinking about this show, I knew they had that Friday night blade the fair thing, but I also knew I couldn't make it due to scheduling issues. Uh, but I also assumed that what they would do is like do the bidding, they do the auctions on the Friday night, um, which is ugly enough as it is. Um, but that the knives though were going to be displayed the, the next day, like all of those other makers would have a table, so you could see what, um, for instance. Uh, uh, freaking Michael Raymond, uh, Todd Rexford actually brought. You could see those knives that were auctioned the next day, even if they were already sold to somebody else. But it didn't turn out that way. Instead, what appears to have happened is that the bidding happened on Friday night, the knives were distributed, and then the makers were just gone. Like, of those makers I listed off, the only person I saw there was uh, uh, Shirogorov, and that's because he still had a table with his production pieces. Um, and that was really disappointing, honestly. I mean, imagine that somebody told you that they, they, they sold you a box of strawberries, and then you later found out that they'd already taken all the best ones out and sold those to somebody else. I mean, at some level, sure, you still got a box of strawberries, strawberries, but at another level, it's like, oh, screw you, um, and I, that, that was really frustrating, I couldn't make it on Friday, many people couldn't afford to make it on Friday, but then, as a result, the, the, the Saturday show just felt picked through, I mean, it felt underwhelming, it was just like, and I don't want to demean the makers who were there on the Saturday, I mean, there were some really incredible pieces there, 100%, but it really felt like there were only a few tables here worth visiting. I mean, they, they, there were, you know, four or five tables that were actually exciting, and the rest was just like, eh, yeah, well, they, they, they can be there too. And that, that works really, uh, what bothers me more about this is that, although there were people there with great cutlery, you know, Willamette, will beg those kinds of folks, uh, Les George, etc., um, Elishevitz, but there were, there were some really great people there, but it works really against the desire for somebody who's brand new to the custom knife hobby, they, you want to show them what what great heights are possible. You want to show them the stuff that's available at the highest of high freaking levels. And unfortunately, they didn't do that. This was just like only the elites get to see that. That was really frustrating. I would have much preferred had they done this a little bit differently, had they done a Saturday night blade affair where everybody had tables on the Saturday, including the high-end makers with the high-end auction pieces. And then on Saturday night, they did the whole auction there. That way, everybody got to see the high-end stuff. And even if they still kick out the unwashed masses at 6 p.m., at least we'd get the full experience. We'd get to see everything. Um, but instead, and that seems like a good way to meet the needs of both ensuring that only serious bidders are there and hosting a, a great show. I think that would have made things better. But unfortunately, that's not the approach they take. And the Friday Night Blade Affair approach, where they skim all the best makers off the top, and again, not to demean the people who weren't there. I don't know the politics would determine that. And there were some people in the show that actually could have belonged in the, fir in the Friday thing. But uh, that... that that approach of skimming things off the top felt absolutely ugly, and it really left me with a little bit of a sour taste in the mouth. It was like, well, that was a good show, but man... If they brought everybody for the real show, that would have been a lot better. And so that left me with a sour taste and left me not loving that. So that's the ugly to me is the Friday Night Blade Affair thing just really ended up hurting the Saturday show. And it's not something I'm in love with myself. Um, final conclusions. Um, so the three big questions. Hey, Nick, did you buy anything? Well, actually, the answer is no. I did want to get a Chris Reeve Lodge Doppler Sebenza, but they sold out before I circled back around. That's kind of on me. I should have just dropped everything. But I figured, oh, what, what other acousticians are running around? the place. Apparently enough of them. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to do that, but I didn't do that. I'll probably get one of those down the road there. Um, uh, but a good friend did end up uh, gifting me this little guy. This is a little Ego Nakami sort of knife um, that's by Oda Knives, O-H-T-A. Um, and, you know, it's not generally my style. It's a friction folder sort of thing. But you know what? It's beautifully made. It's an integral knife out of wood, which is kind of cool. And it's just, it, it's cool. And it, it, I think it's partly for picking them up the airport. But then regardless, it was really kind of them. And so that that's something that's going to bring me a lot of joy. The other thing that I was able to pick up was actually not a knife that I purchased, but this guy came to me via Mass Drop. This is a Mass Drop uh, Perpetua. Um, one of their, uh, this is a TJ Schwartz and Millet Knives made this guy for Mass Drop. And I haven't had a chance to pick one of these guys up, but now I'm going to get a chance. Uh, and so that's actually something that I'm going to be keeping an eye out for a review of this guy coming up before too, too long here. But anyways, uh, they, they gave 
me this guy such that I can review it and then uh, do the charitable thing. So that's that's great of them. Um, but yeah, aside from that, I didn't buy anything else. There was nothing else that quite hit that 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 sweet spot for me where it's like okay, there were some knives I would have considered, but just a little outside my price range. Um, and other people have been asking me, well, what was the best knife there? Of the knives that were available on Saturday, remember I didn't see the stuff that only the elites uh, the 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 the, the, the uh, I I didn't get to see any of that. But of the Saturday knives, I think one of the, the probably the most impressive piece was a custom Astio knife by Beg Knives. I posted it up on my Instagram. But um, it's a really really beautiful piece. It had a great action, great finishing, great engraving, and it just felt like a substantially great piece. Like technically speaking. That was just on point. It's probably not a great choice for EDC. It's definitely not an extra Baz knife, and it is, of course, super expensive, but technically speaking, it was the most impressive of the knives that were available, uh, you know, to check out on the Saturday there. And then the final question a lot of people are asking is, well, would you go back? The answer to that is a definitive maybe. I mean, at some level, it's close enough that there's not a great loss. I mean, I can drive two hours to talk to some great knife people. I mean, and to me, honestly, talking with the people was worth the price of admission for me personally. Getting to have a good conversation with Rick Hinton with Tim Reeve, with Eugene from Alamic, uh, with the, the, the Mass Drop folks, that was great. Um, that was absolutely worth my time. Um, but uh, honestly, if you have to travel more than an hour or two, I'm not sure I'd recommend it. I mean, maybe if they go the next year, if they do the Saturday Night Blade Affair instead, so that the, the, the Saturday show feels like the real show still, um, that, that would be really nice. So maybe they could scrap the whole damn delete member thing and just make the main show as good as it could be. I don't know. I, what do I know? Random jackass here. But the thing is, those things would make it more worth the trip as it stands i'm not quite sure and honestly if you're thinking about this as oh i would fly to this show just save up the money and go to blade blade was a more impressive show by a mile um and you know so eh, there you go so that's my final conclusion on this guy is that it was a very interesting show um i am personally glad i went but that's partly because of the conversations and the people there more so than the knives and although i think it was well managed in many ways there were a couple of easy decisions they could make to really improve the Saturday shows for people next year in the future. So, anyways, hope this has been interesting to you, and have yourselves just an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.